Now let's talk about shock. Shock are different types. The first type is hypovolemic shock due to low blood volume. You can see that in the trauma patient and you're gonna give them fluids. The heart rate will increase. The most reliable early clinical finding for hemorrhagic shock is tachycardia. And you're gonna give the patient two liters bolus of Ranger's lactate followed by a re-evaluation of the vital signs. So the patient will have increased heart rate, increased systemic vascular resistance, and the patient will be cold and clammy. Cardiogenic shock is a poor pump function, decrease the cardiac output, and you'll have decreased peripheral resistance. The one similar to the cardiogenic shock is called the obstructive shock, like cardiac tamponade, pulmonary embolism, have the same features. Another shock is called septic shock. You will have decreased peripheral resistance, vasodilatation, then you have the neurogenic shock, which occurs in a patient with acute spinal cord injury. There will be impaired sympathetic response to the heart and to the blood vessels. There will be circulation collapse with hypotension and bradycardia. Mark the bradycardia, very important. Also, there will be decreased systemic vascular resistance with warm skin. The treatment is one against monitoring for careful fluid intake and you get pressors. Neurogenic shock is not a spinal shock where the bulbocavernosis is out and loss of all spinal cord function and reflex below the level of the lesion. Neurogenic shock is hypotension and bradycardia. The initiation of resuscitation is based on the degree of hemorrhage. So you will start by crystalloid, usually Ringer's lactate, 2 liters, with two lines, and then re-evaluate the vital signs. The patient may have rapid response, transient response, or no response. So if the patient has transient response, the patient is class 3 or 4. Then what's next? You need to get blood. The O negative will be given immediately. The type specific blood will take about 10 minutes and the cross match blood will take 60 minutes. So if the patient is in shock and bleeding, what do you give? You give blood. Which one? O negative blood. What is the ratio? The packed RBC will be 1, fresh frozen plasma will be 1, platelets will be 1, 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. And that will avoid dilution thrombocytopenia. Hepatitis B carries the highest risk for viral transmission in the blood transfusion. So what is the class of hemorrhage? So we have 5 liters of blood. Class 1 is less than 15%. Class 2, we lose 15 to 30%. And the pulse pressure starts getting narrower here. And class 3, 30 to 40%, which is about 1,500 to 2,000 blood loss. That's when you get the hypotension. So you have to lose at least 30% of the blood volume to get hypotension, obviously with some tachycardia and the decreased urine output. Patient will be anxious or confused. Class three is hypotension. Class four, you lose more than 40% of the circulating blood volume. The patient will be confused and lethargic. Class three and class four may not respond to fluid resuscitation and will require blood transfusion. You must have adequate fluid resuscitation, period. 
If you rely on the hemodynamic parameters alone, you will miss subclinical hypotension. Hemodynamic parameters alone is inadequate assessment tool for resuscitation. Another point, you got to correct the hypothermia and coagulopathy. The terrible trauma triad is hypothermia, coagulopathy, and acidosis. These are life-threatening conditions that may become worse by surgery and by anesthesia. Another one connected to hypotension is the head injury patient. Patient with head injury can run into the problem of episodic hypotension intraoperatively, which causes significant increase in mortality. All efforts should be made to avoid hypotension during surgery. Patient with AP pelvis, you can put a binder, you can close the book, you can help with the hypotension and the hemorrhage. But what if the patient has a lateral compression? Then look for another source of bleeding if the patient continues to be unstable despite effort of resuscitation. It's probably not the pelvis. Another one, if you give the patient four units of blood because the patient has pelvic fracture and shock and the patient is not improving, then you need to do angiography and embolization for probably a major arterial bleed in the pelvis, like the superior gluteal artery. So how do you know that the patient is resuscitated? You can do it by several ways. The two ways that come in the exam, either the base deficit from minus two to plus two, or the serum lactate level. The normal is less than 2.5. The blood lactate at the end point of anaerobic metabolism, the blood level of lactate reflect a global hypoperfusion that's directly proportional to the oxygen debt. The base deficit is a direct measure of metabolic acidosis and indirect measure of blood lactate level. Both correlate well with organ dysfunction, mortality, and adequacy of resuscitation. For the sake of an exam, you need to measure two things for adequacy of resuscitation, the blood lactate and the base deficit. Normally, the body utilizes energy from breakdown of glycose. Each molecule will give us two biovate molecules and two ATPs. This occurs when you have oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, the pyruvate will attach to the protons and give lactic acid, which is a strong acid. Lactic acid is a pyruvate that's holding on protons. When the lactate gives away the protons, the protons attaches to bicarbonate, and then you will have base deficit. When the patient is acidotic, it means the body is experiencing inadequate tissue perfusion. Then it undergoes anaerobic mechanism to create some energy, and the lactate is created. The more the lactate level, the more will be a base deficit. You want to be aware of under-resuscitated patient. Be aware of the compensated shock. The patient will be under-resuscitated with normal vital signs. That patient will be at increased risk for huge, exaggerated, systemic inflammatory response. The IL-6 plays a major role in the inflammatory response. IL-6 or interleukin-6 is secreted by the T-cells and by the microphages. It stimulates the immune response, especially during infection and during trauma. The interleukins are a group 
of cytokines, which is secreted proteins and signal molecules. Dial-6 warns the body and the immune system against the source of infection or inflammation. It is like sounding the alarm bell or raising attention to something is wrong. And for these patients, we do damage control orthopedics. For managing this patient, you can always do the emergency things such as pelvis binder or angiography. You release the compartments. You do fasciotomy, even bedside fasciotomy. You will consult vascular surgery for vascular problems. You will prevent further injury of the spine by immobilization of the neck. You will reduce a knee dislocation, for example, or a hip dislocation. You will reduce fracture that will give you soft tissue compromise, like an ankle fracture. You will deal with open fracture by doing a little IND and displint the fractures. You will improve the alignment. You will give antibiotics. You will give tetanus if needed. And you probably will do either traction or external fixation for the femur. Timing of the debridement of open fracture did not really affect the infection rate. Early administration of antibiotics will decrease the rate of infection. And then we're going to take the patient to the operating room as soon as possible after the life-threatening condition is treated and destabilized. And that is still debatable. If the patient is adequately resuscitated, you will take the patient to the operating room and you're going to fix the fracture or you convert the fractures that is stabilized by external fixture to IM rod. 